So tonight, I'm going to start just by letting all of our panelists introduce themselves and talk a little bit about what their relationship is to elections in Clark County, what their interest is, or what work they do uh, related to elections. So we'll go ahead and just start here. So, do you think we need? I do. Yeah, use the mic. The, the mics are better. I'm just shouting. Um, no one wants to shout. Um, and it should be on. Just start talking. Okay. Hi, I'm Lisa McGlawn. I'm an election assistant with the athens Clark County Board of Elections and Voter Registration. I've worked there since 2018. I started as a poll worker, so I've come up through the ranks, um, and now I manage the warehouse where the equipment is housed. Um, we have over a million dollars worth of equipment, and that's my responsibility to make sure it's well taken care of and that you can vote on it on Election Day. Oh, yeah, you can Good evening, everyone. My name is Charlotte Sosby. I serve as the Director of Elections for athens Clark County. I come with 34, I believe 34 and a half years of elections experience. I joined the athens Clark County Unified Government in 2016, and I love elections. <laughs> My name's uh, Rocky Raffle, and I'm the Chair of the Board of Elections. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Broderick Flanagan, and I am the executive director of a 501c3 nonprofit, um, the Economic Justice Coalition. And we've been doing voter registration since the early 2000s. Uh, we took a break and, and started back up uh, around 2008, I want to say. And we've registered or updated the voter registration information of nearly 23,000 people in the Northeast Georgia region over the years. So I wanted to start tonight with a question about um, how does the number of registered voters generally and the percentage of voters participating in elections in Athens compare to overall state rates, to national rates? Um, does being in a university town affect that number? Are there other social and economic factors that might affect um, what percentage of registered voters we have here in athens Clark County? Currently in athens Clark County, we have roughly 72,000 registered voters. And our population, of course, is close to 130,000. So I would say that's a pretty good percentage when it comes to registered voters. And we're always looking for ways where we can encourage our community to register to vote. We conduct um, voter education uh, sessions, and we host our National Voter Registration Week, of course, and we want to attract our community. When it comes to voter turnout, it really depends on what type of election it is. So normally, I, I, we try to prepare, of course, for 100%. Who, want, who wouldn't want 100%? And so we, we keep that factor in mind, and we always go back and look at what history tells us, which it tells us a lot about what the voting habit is for our community. And so depending on the election, unfortunately, the special elections and runoffs usually run pretty low digits. Um, I've seen some very low voter turnouts, 9%. If I could think of one of the lower percentages, and that was in a special election like a um, referendum, well, I'm going to say something like a SPLOST. But when we have um, a gubernatorial election, it's usually in the 50 percentile, but it's something about when we have the presidential election that just brings everybody out, and that's when we are in the 70 percentile. One of the things that um, recently we were listening to some of the webinars that we've, we're part of, different organizations, and we found that Georgia, alongside with Texas, we're right there under Texas when it comes to voting early. So we know that there's some habits of voting early. I encourage voting early, um, and that's one of the things that we try to make sure we do is have as many opportunities for our voters to cast their ballots early. Our board is very gracious about uh, providing additional days and times, extended hours for our advanced voters. And so we're like up in the 58%, I believe, when it comes to advanced voting. 
And, um, but yeah, that's, that's where we are as far as our population. And I'm going to leave a little bit for Rocky and Lisa to add to. Yeah, I don't have a lot to add. I would say that uh, on average across the state, we're a little lower generally than we should be as far as turnout usually. Um, a city like ours should probably be having a higher rate of voters, which is, is disappointing to me every time, even if it's an East Bloss, like we are, the board's always asking, how can we get these people out? How can we tell them this is happening? How can we explain that everything is important and that you should vote on everything because it affects your life and all that? And I think from, from our standpoint over Economic Justice Coalition, uh, when you think about the going further into the data and looking at the racial demographics or the racial break, breakdown of the vote, um, in many cases, African Americans are still turning out very disproportionately lower than their counterparts. And so we try to find ways to encourage other minority groups to participate civically as well, um, to increase those numbers and that, that type of engagement. Um, we believe everyone, everyone should have an opportunity to participate in the democratic process. Um, and, and we try to find creative ways to engage those populations, to get them to turn out, to get them registered, um, to let them know about the upcoming elections. Um, that's a big bulk of the work that we do. Um, you know, there, there's, a, uh, you know, I, I won't go into that right now, but, you know, there's just a lot of reasons why people um, sometimes from those communities don't show up to vote. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, we're dedicated to staying engaged with those populations and keeping them informed uh, through a lot of education, advocacy, and uh, engagement. I don't think anybody talked about college voting. So um, I can do that a little bit, and then Charlotte might have something she wants to add. Then UGA, I think, does affect our voter population in that they come and go every four years. Um, so our, regi our registration numbers sometimes fluctuate, um, showing that decrease and increase. Not every student that comes here registers in Clark County. They may reg stay registered in their home county. So what we try to do is a lot of education with the college voters about how to maintain their voter registration properly so that they don't walk into one of our precincts thinking they can vote and when they're registered in their home county, because that can be very frustrating for them. Um, when they don't understand that process. We also hold voting um, when we're invited on the uh, UGA campus at the Tate Center usually. During 2020, we were asked to hold voting um, in Stegman, which was really wonderful and had a large turnout. Um, we also held a voter event recently on the UGA campus to give them some of this information and help them understand what their um, responsibilities are towards their registration and what might happen if they go to the DMV <laughs> and move their driver's license from to maybe to their new college address. Well, that will relocate their voting registration unless they fill out the paperwork properly, and they don't always know that. So we just try to be there for them. Yeah, the one thing that I would add to the Tate Center thing is kind of like a future, future of elections dream that I have is, so with the Tate Center, there's only... Clark County voters that can vote there. Is, is someday in the future, if we can have universal voting where all the students can vote at the Tate Center? Because it, it, I think it's doable, hopefully, but I think we need to change the laws and stuff to do that. But I mean, where, where else in the state do you have a representation of the entire state, people from all over, so they can just cast their vote while they're at college and not have to drive four hours down to Waycross to vote? There's also a lot of people who come into the community to work every day from surrounding counties right. as well. So you can see that makes it potentially helping people. Is, I, I think all of you have already been touching on uh, some, some aspects of, uh, of outreach that either uh, Athens Park County or the, or, the, or the board or NGOs do to try to get people registered to vote. Um, is there any more you'd like to share about maybe some of the outreach you've been doing? And we were already talking about uh, UGA. Roger, did you want to share more about? 
Um, sure. Uh, the Economic Justice Coalition, of course, we're a nonpartisan, uh, nonprofit organization. Uh, we do have reach in the Northeast Georgia region, though. We serve about a 13 county region, um, which includes Athens, Clark County. And we have canvassers and, and coordinators that go out and try to recruit volunteers on the one hand and train them in voter registration practices and, and, and best practices and protocol to make sure that we are registering people properly. Um, we want to make sure that when we register people, that they're able to cast their ballot, you know, but sometimes mistakes and mishaps happen. So we try to pay attention to those details uh, when we're filling out the voter cards or up updating somebody's change of address or something like that. Um, and so we have people that go out on a regular basis to what we call hot spots. Uh, we'll go to grocery stores if we have permission, uh, gas stations, uh, civic centers, libraries in outlying counties, uh, school, school events sometimes where parents will, will frequent. Um, I've learned recently that um, youth can register to vote at 17 and a half um, if there will be uh, 18 and less than six months to the next upcoming election. Um, they can go ahead and register, if I'm not mis mistaken. <laughs> and so, um, you know, just knowing things like that and equipping, equipping our canvassers and coordinators with the information and knowledge to, to go out in the community and to really encourage people. Um, we, we train them not to be too aggressive, but a lot of times people say, well, what's the use of voting, you know? And we have a lot of conversations about that as well. A lot of people are discouraged from voting for, for a myriad of reasons. And um, we want to combat that because again we think that people should participate in the civic process and and and, and what version of de democracy we have you know we we want people to be able to participate in that um because non-participation means something as well you know and so um yeah yeah that's that's what i'll say about that from the board's perspective uh it's not so much about education, but providing the access and the opportunity and the and the convenient places to vote, so that the other groups, one, the candidates and the nonprofits, can do what they need to do to bring the people to vote for their candidate. Yeah. What, uh, so I know that uh, uh, recently the uh, changes in polling places have been approved, and you have this great map. Uh, down here, I encourage everybody to take a closer look at the map uh, uh, before you leave tonight. Uh, but uh, do you want to share a little bit more about maybe some of the thoughts behind some of the changes that uh, that happened, and what um, and what maybe were uh, some of the benefits that that we're hopefully going to see from these changes? Yeah. So the first thing I'll say that I always say is that there was a net zero. We started with 24, we ended with 24. So that's important to note. Um, some of the polling places we had just simply outgrown, uh, you know, room space, parking, accessibility. Some of the buildings won't exist in the future, such as the mall. Um, some of the polling places were actually out of precinct, so people were having to drive out of their precinct into another to vote in a, just an inadequate space. So um, some of the new locations are uh, the community room at the airport. Uh, and so those, Charlotte could probably explain more of the technical pieces of this, but we basically just took all the lines away when we started the process. We took all the lines away. We said, okay, which, which precincts are working, which are not. And then we looked at alternative solutions for that. And then the wonderful uh, athens Clark County GIS department used uh, their sophisticated mapping tools and, and first just set their program to say this many voters, who's the closest, what's the nearest precinct to your address? So then they did that, but then we ended up with lopsided precincts. You know, some would have 1,000 and some would have 5,000. Some locations can handle 5,000 voters, some cannot. So looking at making sure that it's balanced so when you go on election day, you're not super long line here and nobody at the one down the street. Yeah. 
I think yes, that's we, about it. Yeah. Yeah. And we also took in consideration uh, with our new voting equipment, of course, it requires a certain amount of watts and circuitry. And so we know how many or how much voting equipment we can put in each location. And then making that determination, how many voters can vote in a minute or an hour. A lot of those things were taken in consideration so that we could cut down on lines. And like, like Rocky said, you know, you didn't want to have a precinct that had a long line and then you go down just, just a block away because, you know, our landmass is really small. One of the things I like about athens Clark County. And so these 24 precincts, they're close by, but then you're going to have a voter who lives just across the street from someone else who's going to the left side to vote where this person across the street is going to the right side within the same vicinity, and then there's not a line down the street, you know. So those those were a lot of things that were taken in consideration. I'm excited about the change. There, every single precinct line was adjusted, and so we, we've got to make those changes and, of course, inform every voter that was affected by the change. And when we make the determination of how many of those voters are, we may end up just sending every voter in, in athens Clark County a voter registration card because this is a big buzz that's going on right now that, you know, there's going to be some polling location changes. So we don't want, because you don't get a card, you're, you're, you're concerned like, well, did my, pro, my precinct change? So it may be that everybody in Clark County, every voter in Clark County will receive a, a registration card. So, yeah, and I've seen a lot of polling location changes, and this has been really one that a lot of energy, a lot of legal things were looked at. I mean, we dotted every I, crossed every T, and when we get ready to do our data changes, we're going to do the same thing to make sure that there aren't any errors. And, um, and of course, any voter that has any questions about where they would vote, then that's something that can be accessed not just through our office, but my voter page through the Secretary of State's office. And those changes will be effective the March election. So it won't be any changes that will be seen yet because we do have an election in November. So we can't really touch anything yet. But December, during Christmas holidays, you will be having conversations with your family around the table about your polling location change. I can imagine. Yes, very exciting. Yes. <laughs> you don't go to the mall this time. <laughs> um, well, um, I guess speaking of the, uh, uh, the, I thought it was interesting you mentioned about having to have so much tech, uh, how much tech, you know, support that you need to have just to have the, the setup right to, to enough power, enough outlets, um, you know, all those things. Um, you mentioned at the start, Lisa, that you're in charge of a million dollars worth of equipment. Uh, share with us a little bit more about what the process is for safekeeping that equipment, uh, what, um, uh, and I guess just a little bit more about, uh, about the machines in general. Okay, well now you found what I love. Yes. <laughs> I don't know how I ended up with this position to do this, but it, it really has just, um, I love it so much. Um, okay, so I has, I'm pretty sure everyone in the room has voted on our new voting equipment. It's not really new anymore. We've had it for three years now, so hopefully I won't have to explain as much as I would have in 2020. And so we um, own, I wish I had my numbers in front of me, but I think it's close to 300 ballot marking devices. We have 48 precinct scanners. Um, we have clo uh, the poll pads that we use. I believe we have 164. Um, so it's a lot of equipment. And then all of this equipment is connected to uninterrupted power supplies because the ballot marking devices don't have batteries in them. So if the power goes out, it has to be connected to something to keep everything going. So we own a number of, I think it's like a um, less, little less than 200 um, uninterrupted power supply batteries <laughs> that weigh about 50 pounds a piece. <laughs> Yeah, and, and we have printers for every single ballot marking device. Um, we also have three central scanners that we use to run our ballots, our um, absentee ballots through on the couple of days before the election when we can start early tabulation and then on election day and sometimes on through the night, depending on how many we have. We've done that before. 
Um, and we have our election management system, which is the computer that um, we use to tabulate the votes and that runs the election project, which is what is loaded into the ballot marking devices so that you can vote each and every election. Um, testing, I can tell you a little bit about that. Oh, you asked about safeguarding. So safeguarding the equipment. The equipment is held in a secure warehouse. Well, it's in a secure building at 2555 Lexington Road if you ever want to know where your election equipment is held. Um, I work in that space. And it's in the center of the facilities management building, so it can't be accessed from an outside door. Our inside interior doors are, um, have secure locks and alarm systems on them. We have a video monitored security system on them, so there's a camera going 24 hours a day while we're working in there. And when we're not there, we know what's happening. Um, and so it's very secure. And my, the, uh, the room where the election management system is held is on a separate, in a separate room with separate locks. So no one goes in there unless they sign in and I know that they're going in and out. Um, for testing, every election, uh, before the election, we get what's called an election project. And that has um, the ballot on it and everything that we need to run an election. We load that into the election management system and then I do what I need to do with that to produce the USB devices that are loaded into the ballot marking devices. And then we run a process called logic and accuracy testing. It's open to the public, so I encourage you to come. If you ever, we would love to show off <laughs> what we do and have you there with us while we do this process. So basically what happens is we run an election. We run an election on that equipment. We test every single ballot. We test every single piece of equipment and how it interacts with each other. And then it's uploaded into the election management system and we make sure that those results are accurate before any piece of equipment is ever sent out. Huh? <laughs> we, we, we test every single piece of equipment before it goes out. And if something is found that is not to our liking, no matter what it is, um, it could be something very minor, like you know, maybe we can't get the time to set correctly on the BMD. It just doesn't go out, and we put out, we have enough equipment that we can replace it with one that's operating completely properly. And then the Secretary of State's office helps us repair any equipment that is um, broken. Is that okay? Uh, can you, anytime you touch it or like open it, there's talk oh. about the tamper. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. So we have logs. It's our equipment maintenance log, basically, like any warehouse would have, where every piece of equipment has a serial number on it. Every time we touch the equipment, it's documented. Every time a seal is opened, we documented that we broke that seal and the number of the seal and then replace it with a new seal. <laughs> so there is a lot of security that goes on with each piece of equipment, and we track all of it so that if you ever came and asked us, hey, that BMD over there, what locations has it been to? How many times has it been used? What elections was it used for? Um, has it ever been pulled for maintenance? We can tell you. Um, which is very important, I think, so that everyone knows that their equipment is in good working order. And just to add a little to that, once the equipment is tested, it's set aside for election day, and then it's the, the seal is logged on the recap sheet that the manager, the poll manager receives at the polling precinct. They're to verify that that's, that same seal is on there to make sure that it has been has not been tampered with from testing onto election day. And then once those votes are recorded on election night, there's another seal that's put on the machine. It's recorded on the recap sheet by the manager, and it's verified by our office when it returns to the warehouse. So there's a, a log of every time it's touched, every time a seal is placed on it, and it's verified every single time. And as Lisa mentioned, it's open to the public. You can go, you can watch it, bring a friend that may not vote like you, that may vote opposite of you, so they can come and watch it. Uh, media, come and, come and see what they're doing, watch what they're doing. It's, there's, they're doing good work, good, honest work in that warehouse. And just to allay your fears, no one ever touches our equipment unless someone who is employed by the athens Clark County Board of Election and Voter Registration knows about it. Okay. So I guess I'd like to know a little bit more about, and, and I think 
I'd like to hear from, from uh, all of you on this, but maybe a little bit more as to what, um, or about what Athens Park County is doing, but also what you hear from people on this, on this topic. But what is being done to make, you know, voting more accessible for people with altered abilities or, um, or even like the quantity and locations of drop boxes for absentee voting? Um, I'd like to hear a little bit from both on your both perspectives there too. So, what's being done and how people are perceiving it, I guess, would be. So I'll talk a little bit about the drop boxes. So in the t during the 2020 election, there was an emergency plan that was put in place by the Secretary of State's office and the state election board that allowed for counties to have drop boxes for voters to return their absentee ballots. And if you recall, during the 2020 election, you as a, as a registered voter in the state of Georgia, you received a registered an application for an absentee ballot in the mail. So it was encouraged that there be no contact during that time of the, ap the epidemic. So the drop boxes were put in place. And at the time, Clark County had, I believe, eight drop boxes throughout the county. And they were pretty much, I'm going to say, um, nine. OK. <laughs> Yeah, because I think we added one at the last minute. Yeah, so they were pretty scattered out and in, you know, not like close vicinity of each other, but scattered out where we could um, provide that access to all of our voters, not just in a certain area downtown or in different areas of athens Clark County. And then in 2021, there was a Senate bill that passed, Senate Bill 202, that only allowed for counties to have only one drop box, depending on your population, your voting population. And I believe the threshold is 100,000. You could have more. And so that meant that athens Clark County qualified for only one drop box. And that drop box had to be only available during advanced voting, had to be monitored, humanly monitored, because at the time we were just monitoring our drop boxes by camera, but there is a human that has to actually be available to monitor that box. So um, I'm going to say um, we moved our drop box inside the, the, the office because that's the only way we could monitor our drop box, humanly monitor it and to be able to close it down when advanced voting was not taking place. And so if I was going to talk about the number of ballots that we received through our drop boxes compared to 2020, it would be really hard to make that determination because there was a pandemic going on at the time, epidemic going on at the time. So um, it'd be really hard to, to make that um make that estimate. But I will tell you that our voters didn't really hear any complaints from our voters here in Clark County, but I did notice that it was being utilized during advanced voting. And um, yeah, I, I wanted to kind of comment on that, but hope y'all will add more. Um, the, the question was related to how do we assist uh, people that are not able to make it out sometimes or differently yeah, able yeah. to help them vote. Um, yeah, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I just want to make sure I'm staying on message. <laughs> um, well, within our organization, Economic Justice Coalition, we do offer rides to the polls um, for more seasoned people or people that have been around more season, seasons than I. <laughs> um, some people call them elderly, you know. And but you know so so we do offer rides to the polls uh, for those populations and people with uh, you know able differently able uh, ability. Uh, we want to make sure that you know again everybody has the opportunity to participate. And so we we started doing that. I can't pull any exact numbers off the top of my head right now, but people do get excited about rides to the polls. Um, I started doing that when I uh, became a neighborhood leader, actually, um, before I took on the role of executive director with Economic Justice Coalition. I was on the board, but I would, through that position, I would offer people rides uh, to the poll um, around that time as, as part of my, my work schedule. 
And so um, some of the residents in my zone really appreciated that. And they were asking me, like, hey, are you going to come pick me up for this election, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I really appreciated them for asking that as well and for, for um, relying or leaning on us for that type of service, you know? Uh, that, that impact is immeasurable, in my opinion. Uh, and then we, uh, one of our state partners does monitor like the closing of, of polling locations uh, because, again, in certain people in certain areas, uh, they don't have transportation or can't get to certain poll polling locations for whatever reason. And so we, we do keep a close eye on that. I know sometimes, like they just mentioned earlier, that different locations close for a myriad of reasons. Um, at, at the same time, we have to strike a balance um, in between, like, you know, what the um, Board of Elections or state agencies are able to do versus, you know, what's good for the community, you know, and, and the community perception of that. Um, some of that is, you know, boils down to communication, you know, and, and talking to people about why a certain poll, uh, polling location may be closing. Um, but we do keep an eye on that. Um, and then we also just do voter uh, protection education. Um, you know, there are certain mishaps that happen, I think, mistakes that happen sometimes when people go to the polls, whether they put the, a, a wrong address on, on their voter card or they move during that process and the, their, their ID on their, uh, or their address on their ID doesn't match which is on their voter registration. And so there are a lot of different ways in which people get turned around. We try to do voter uh, protection in those cases as well. Um, and then we also offer like absentee ballots uh, for people um, or at least encourage people to fill out absentee ballots. We can't turn them in for them, of course, but we do let people know about like when, what are the deadlines for absentee ballots. And then we help uh, pass those out or help people understand where to get those and what to do. Because um, some people are just uh, unaware of that process you know, and, and don't know what to do or how to do it. And we try to uh, inform people on that, too, or point them to websites that have that information. You asked about um, educating disabled voters or helping to provide for them. So recently we had, there was a National Week of um, Disabled Voter Education Week, or Disabled Voter Rights Week. And we held an event at the library that was just for that. And we put a lot of effort into that. We had transit there. Um, to help people understand um, ways to get to the polls and how to use their transportation effectively um, if they needed help. We had a computer there and an application available if anyone wanted to apply to be a poll worker. We could help them apply and um, get them in to help us because we, we love to have um, all kinds of people from the, from the community help us um, on the polls. We didn't have the turnout that we wanted, but we were really there. <laughs> we were there and tried our best to provide that information to the community. Now, the American with Disabilities Act and the Help America Vote Act um, require, which we want to provide these things, but they require us to provide um, a piece of equipment that is accessible for people who are visually impaired or, um, you know, or they need to they need to use headphones, you know, to listen to the ballot so we have that available to them. Um, they can increase the font on the ballot if that helps so that they can see the the writing a little bit better. Um, so that has to be provided there for them. And then when we were considering these precincts, we also had to, the precinct changes, we had to consider places that met ADA requirements so that people can get in and out easily. And there are a lot of requirements, and believe me, we go out with our tape measures and our um, device that measures the pounds per inch <laughs> to open a door um, to make sure that everyone is, is, that we comply with these laws and everyone is able to vote as easily as everyone else. Um, I, I think that generally, uh, at, least, at least in my opinion, uh, that the uh, longer early voting periods uh, in more locations has been seen as a really positive way to make voting more convenient for people. And it sounded like from those numbers you quoted earlier that, that people in Georgia definitely do embrace having the early voting. Um, it does seem to me though that that requires perhaps even more trained poll workers. And uh, so has it been easier or more difficult to recruit poll workers than it maybe was in the past, maybe five, ten years ago? Or and maybe what are some of what are 
you know, drawbacks that keep people from volunteering at the polls, or what, you know, what issues are, are making sure that poll workers are uh, representing our community as a whole. Um, and uh, so I'd like to hear a little more about all that. I think that would be me to answer that first. Um, I manage our poll worker population. We have about 300 poll workers. Not all of them work every election. Some of them work one election and then I never hear from them again, but they're still on our rolls. Um, but we have a lot of dedicated poll workers. I see one sitting in the audience right now who works every single election and we, we love them. Um, it takes an average of 270 people to run an election. There's usually six to 10 people that work each polling location. It's a long, arduous day, so it takes some stamina. You don't have to be young to have that stamina, but you definitely have to be able to make it from 6 a.m. in the morning until about 8 p.m. that night. Um, we, it's been interesting since I've had this job. I came into this job, so I can't tell you what recruiting was like before 2018, but I can tell you during the pandemic, when this became my full-time job, recruiting was a nightmare. <laughs> but we managed to do it. Um, we pulled from athens Clark County workers, too. And I think as when Broderick said he was a neighborhood leader, I think I remember during that time I had him on a list that I could call him as a poll worker because we were so badly in need of people. Um, of course, things have settled out now. And usually when we open our application, which is about three months before each election, Sometimes we'll get as many as two or three hundred applications. I mean, it's it's been a lot. Like during um, 2022, we got several, a lot of applications, more people than we could hire. We want to. You asked about all of these locations that we're opening up and early voting locations. It does take a little bit more skill um, or experience to help in an advanced voting location, but that's changing too because. That was because of our check-in process. But our check-in process has changed now, too. The state has made it much easier, so it's like working on election day. So I think that that's going to open up some opportunities for our poll workers. We're looking very closely at providing shift work for our um, early voting workers specifically. So because there are so many hours and so many days in a row, and they also work election day, most of them, they're exhausted by the time election day comes around. So we're looking at providing shift work for them so that we can you know, maybe just have someone come in and work half a day, and that'll be a lot easier for people to dedicate that time to us. So you ask what the challenges are. Mostly with early voting is you know, people have jobs and they have lives, and it's hard to ask somebody a couple of times a year, hey, just don't go to your job for three weeks and come help us. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. So we're piecing together schedules with as much as 100 people sometimes to make early voting run, just the early voting locations. Yeah. What? The pay rate. The pay rate. Yeah. Oh, um, <laughs> it recently changed, and I don't know it off the top of my head. 1560 to 1794. 15, so 1794 is what a manager is paid. Um, and then you have assistant managers that have an in between rate there. And then our clerks make um, 1560 an hour. So it's not, it's, it's volunteer. You're bringing your, you're taking your time away from your normal job, but it's not volunteer. You will get paid <laughs> yeah. for the time that you're yeah. there. And you yeah. do become a part time temporary employee of Athens Clark County when you do this. Mm -hmm. Yes. And students. Yes. Oh, students. yeah. Yes. So stu I didn't know how much you wanted to hear. I didn't want to hog the mic. So <laughs> student poll workers. Um, in 2020, we worked really hard to develop a student poll worker program, and we were hiring from the high schools because when you're 16 years old, you can be a poll worker. Um, my son, of course, started at 16 because I'm his mom, so he had to. <laughs> <laughs> and he still works with us to this day. Um, and we have several people in our, most of the people in our office, their children who have been old enough have worked with us. Yes. Our student poll workers were just a joy to have. They are faster on the electronic equipment. They're not frightened of it. They have a great time. They lift the spirits of everybody that they work with. Um, we've had a few of them who have stuck around on into their college years, and one is a poll manager now. We just, we love her to death. <laughs> Um, there, well, there's two actually. Then they're both. One's a student at University of North Georgia, and the other one's a student at UGA, and they're still with us. 
Um, we have not been able to recruit as heavily in the schools as I would like for um, between 2020 and now, so our students are aging out, but that's one thing that I really want to find the time to get back to doing is um, going into the high schools and recruiting again. Yes. That was a lot. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, there's just one thing I wanted to add is, you know, bills um, that have come out in the past, like SB 202 and some of the other ones that uh, didn't go through the legislature last year, they're filled with uh, tons of unfunded mandates and new forms and new things and new rules and and it's just piling on the workload so that that I think contributes to why we have a challenge in getting new people or folks that um, have done it forever that said, eh, that's enough. So, um, and then also given the, the current climate of the world and related to elections, there's a lot of pressure, there's a lot of eyes, there's a lot of, you're, you're not just an elections clerk, you're, it's, very serious work. I mean, we've seen what's happened to election clerks in Georgia. So um, I think those are things that people think about when they're applying to this job. So. Well, I'm going to open it up to, for the floor for questions. Um, and uh, you can have a question for everyone. You can have a question for one person. Um, and uh, yes. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how you interface with the Secretary of State? Uh, if at all, with the Board of Elections. And I'm uh, not familiar with the details, but I think this is a relatively new uh, procedure which can involve, in certain circumstances, intervention uh, at the County Board of Election area. And I'd be very interested if you could sort of talk about those aspects of your. Incidentally, I do want to tell you how impressive, at least uh, from my point of view, this is. What a terrific job you're doing. And I was an election judge in Texas, and we have worked elections in Texas for many years. So we say that with a great deal of respect for what you're doing. Well, thank you. So I think the question was about uh, maybe it was a bill a couple of years ago where they um, created a, a committee that could essentially take over boards of elections, is that your question? Yeah. So uh, as a board member, that's um, a person, uh, I'll speak uh, personally first, is I, that's, I'm not a, that's an intimidation. I'm not, I'm not worried about that. We're here to do a job for the voters, so I'll say that. But um, as a board, we're just trying to find the line between how do we follow the law and the rules that are put forward by the state election board, but how do we innovate within the law? How do we find that one little thing that makes it a little bit better here and there? Much like, uh, you know, we were talking about the pull pads, or not the pull pads, sorry, looking at the wrong line, the drop boxes. So that was an innovative way to provide access. Well, what happened in 2020? Some candidates won, some didn't. And then they created bills based on conspiracy theories that aren't true, and now we don't have drop boxes. That's how I believe it all went down, right? So just finding ways to be innovative in what we're doing. Um, one of the things we're working on currently, we're in the process of selecting a vendor, is uh, providing our elections materials in Spanish. Our um, we're not going as far as the, the ballot itself, but we're hoping to have a sample ballot that's printed in Spanish. And some of the education materials that are in the office is, is you know, a way to innovate, um, try to do new things. Yes. Yes, so Georgia is a, is a top-down state. So it, we follow the Secretary of State office um, seeking their leadership on a lot of the bills that 
are passed in legislature, and then within our counties, we try to create best practices. And um, not only just the state, the Secretary of State's office and the General Assembly, it's also the State Election Board. And so those that's where our rules and regulations come from that follow by that are followed by the acts or the bills that are passed. And so, um, and then of course our state, our election board, our local election board, again creates policies and and things that that tag on to those uh, bills and rules. And we just follow with best practices. 159 counties, and then there's 159 ways to to get our jobs done. But I appreciate you sharing that about being an election judge. I always wondered what, you know, the election judge versus what we actually do. And it's about basically the same thing what the poll workers do. So um, that's interesting. And I hope you'll consider joining us. Well, thanks. I'm afraid I think, yeah. <laughs> and I mean by that, as you have absolutely accurately stated, that uh, it is a very physical, sometimes even emotionally demanding job. And uh, it really is essential to be up to it. And I'm so pleased, as a gratuitous comment, to hear that you are considering shift work. Uh, that can make a huge difference. And we did not have that when we were in Texas. I think you'll hear about a lot of states doing it because it's it's a big topic. When uh, we went to our national conference, I, I attended a, a breakout session, and I specifically wanted to go to hear about that. And, and I was surprised at how many states are already having shift work. So I've brought it back, and I said, you know, we're going to talk about this. I know it's been something that we've, you know, we've kind of touched on, but we're going to try it out in November. So hopefully by the November, hopefully by the November 2024 election, we'll have it all worked out. Yeah. It's good to hear. I mean, 14-hour day. That's a long day for anybody. So, um, other questions? Yes. Um, a sticker. Is a sticker... Um, can you speak to, you're talking about innovation, I thought that was pretty innovative. Can you speak to what you all have the city doing, you know, uh, or the challenge that you um, imparted about the stickers? I do love a good voting sticker. I so. do. Yeah, I was excited. It's, it's really the main reason to vote here. Yes. So yes, I'm I'm so excited about this. So I, I I wanted to get some kind of feedback and engagement with our community. So I shared with the staff. I said, y'all, I think we need to come up with our own advanced voting sticker. We have the Georgia Peach, and that's a sticker that everybody has. But I would like for our voters to be traveling, like maybe to a meeting during advanced voting, and they go into another county, and somebody has on a sticker, and it's recognized. Oh, that's a Clark County advanced voting sticker. I want to think we're the first county maybe in the state of Georgia who's doing this. And um, I'm really excited. We had, so we pitched it to our community. I actually turned in four myself and mine didn't get picked. But I'm surprised. But anyway, so, <laughs> so we, I think we narrowed it down to like four finalists. We had over 400 entries. Yes, wow. yes. Wow. There was some some classes, some I think third graders or fourth graders that has submitted some. They were adorable. But um, we will be announcing. We will be announcing. I think tomorrow the winner of our sticker contest. And um, yeah, I think it's going to be revealed tomorrow. <laughs> No, I don't think it's been revealed yet, but we've revealed it to the winner, I think. Um, and I think Athens is going to be very pleased about this sticker. And I have, um, Lisa doesn't know this yet, but this is what I want to do, is I want our advanced voters to receive two stickers when they vote early. I want them to receive the advanced voting sticker, but I also want them to have the peach sticker so they can wear it on election day. Because one of the things I don't like to see is that an advanced voter is out walking in the community and somebody thinks they didn't vote. You mean they haven't voted? You know? 
So have that peach sticker as well so that they can have that on election day. That's important. I remember my grandmother having her peach sticker and she kept it on her apron. And one day she was out at the grocery store and she had her apron on and I don't even think she knew it. And I said, Grandma, you know you got your peach sticker on, don't you? She said, oh, I wear that everywhere in, when, I'm, when I'm baking. So, yeah. And, and I've seen them on the back of people's Bibles. <laughs> Like a preacher's preaching, I go, oh my God, he's got his peach sticker on his Bible. So I'm excited about our sticker. And um, uh, and, I'm, and I'll say this too, when we went to our national conference, they, there were uh, states that brought in some of their stickers, and we went back and was able to pull some of their stickers. And they were just, uh, yeah, this was like a trading table. And it was just amazing. Um, we're... People want those stickers. So, yeah, I'm really excited about ours. <laughs> okay, yes. Um, yeah, and uh, I, I I'll just go out and build on what Bruce said. I also think that poll workers should be treated the same way that uh, jury duty is. Everybody should have to do it. Everybody gets paid. They get cycled through. It's a system we have to do just like the jury does. But um, with that being said, uh, I wondered if, if all of y'all could talk about the challenges of battling misinformation just in the current culture that we have, especially around um, the the technicalities of voting. I mean, I, 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 like Lisa, you went through all of those different layers of transparency that we have, um, but you know, most people don't know it, and that misinformation still passes through so much. So I wondered if uh, if y'all could talk about any uh, challenges y'all have, especially especially challenges that your office has received including like any OR request, which I know has been happening around the state. And then to, to Broderick, I, I wondered if, if you could speak a little bit about um, just the challenges of work interacting with the public around that, you know, how that misinformation creates so much distrust and apathy, you know, around our voting. So. I'll start with the misinformation and then one of the things I do as chair is I make a proactive effort to talk to the media, to explain what's happening, to keep folks informed, um, what little media we have in this town. Um, uh, just to explain what's happening, educate people, just be a face in the community so people know that they can trust our elections office and they can trust the process. Um, and. It, you mentioned, Lisa talked about the transparency, but that's like a 16th of all the other checks and balances in the system. Uh, you know, everything happens in pairs, everything happens in a bipartisan way if necessary. Um, there, I remember during the 2020 election, uh, my colleague who is the um, Republican appointee and the Democratic appointee for the board, there was a, a question about a ballot had got like stuck under a lid of the drop box or something. And the two of us sat down and watched the video and we both agreed and concluded the same thing that we should indeed c count this, I think is what we did. Okay. But, you know, working together, trying to, to uh, get the right info out. Okay. So mis- and disinformation is a huge problem. It's a problem all over the country. It's not just in elections, it's in everything. It's hard to know what to believe anymore. But for us, Charlotte mentioned going to our national conference. Some of the breakout sessions that I focused on were the mis- and disinformation sessions that were held by Homeland Security and the FBI and um, CISA. Please do not ask me right now what CISA stands for. Yeah. It's basically the cybersecurity yeah. a, a branch of, the, of Homeland Security. They're worried about it too. Um, there's, there's not a lot of things, well, I shouldn't say that. There are things that we can do at, at the level that we're at, make sure that we're constantly putting out accurate information, make sure that when our clerks or Charlotte or I talk to someone on the phone that we're, we're patient with them, we're giving them the correct information, we're assuaging their fears as much as we can. I mean, sometimes it feels like being a counselor the closer it gets to elections, but that's our job, so we don't mind doing that. Um, for me, where I deal with it the most is people that come to observe election processes in the warehouse. So after elections, um, when we do our risk-limiting audit, 
Uh, there'll be hopefully not as many people as there were in 2020, but hopefully there will be people who come from the community to watch us and people always have questions. Some people come because they're skeptical and because they want to catch you doing something. Mm -hmm. But by the time they leave, I think most of the time we've won them over and they realize that, that their votes are in good hands in Clark County. So a lot of times it's just a face that we put on for the community, making sure that we're out there talking to them, telling them what we know as the truth with the job that we do every day and hopefully correcting mistakes or just misinformation that they have about the processes that we do. And hopefully it makes them feel better. Yes, and I'm always encouraging them to get involved so you can see elections from all sides. And there, there's no other way to see it than from a poll worker standpoint. And you get to see, you know, how all of the security measures are in place. When you're trained as a poll worker, you understand the fact that there's not just one person who is in the room, so to speak, all the time, touching one thing all the time. Um, so it's all about doing things in teams, all the processes in teams, and signing oaths, because every poll worker, every one of us have taken oaths and will take an oath. Uh, talking about open records request, we, boy, were we flooded with open records request after the 2020 elections. And usually those come after election periods, but open records requests never stop. Uh, we have an average of maybe four or five a month. Um, and again, it's about being transparent, um, honoring those open records requests according to the Open Records Act, um, answering them timely is definitely proof that we're not hiding anything. We're being very transparent. And of course, we always encourage our community to come out to our sessions that we teach so that we can provide any type of changes that might have taken place in the General Assembly. I talked about the session that we started. We started the sessions to be held every odd number year. And so in 2021, we talked a lot about our the, the changes in Senate Bill 202. And so I feel that getting ahead of that with our voters, that they weren't really surprised when the 2020 elections came up because we put that information out there. So that's one of the ways that we deal with the mis and disinformation is again, like Rocky said, getting ahead and trying to get information about the changes in the processes. Um, yeah, and, th and thank you for that question, um, Tim. And so from my perspective and, and the ways I see it showing up and deal with it, um, I'm still learning a lot myself. Um, I, I started off as just a, an observer of local um, politics in 2014. Uh, of course, I, 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 that was around a time when I actually started voting in local elections. I had never really voted in a local election prior to that, I don't think. Um, and so once I got involved with Economic Justice Coalition, that's when I started to learn about different things related to voting, the misinformation, disinformation. Um, one of the things that we do through Economic Justice Coalition is we partner with a state agency that keeps up with uh, the changes in um, different legislation around voting and things of that nature. And so staying uh, up to uh, speed and abreast of those things, uh, is, is it helps us tremendously uh, when we run into people um, that, that share misinformation or, or try to tell us misinformation about the process. And so we try to stay up to speed with that and, and educate people on that when we can. Um, but it's still kind of hard because people tune into their um, information vacuums and they hold on to that uh, with, for dear life sometimes. I've seen it and they won't budge from it. Um, and then one specific thing that I want to speak to that I've run into a, a great deal of, uh, and again, I had to educate myself on this because I wasn't even aware of it, uh, was uh, people with criminal backgrounds um, not thinking they can vote or re-register to vote. And so as I understand it, um, if you are, have been convicted or are convicted, once you pay your fines and fees, once you serve your sentence, and once you are off, with, off probation or done with probation, you can then re-register uh, to vote. And so that is something that I had to learn. I had to educate myself around because I was under the impression that they couldn't vote either, you know. 
And so I have also myself been, you know, because I used to tell people, I was like, well, you know, you're a convicted felon, you can't vote, you know. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, uh, just uh, being mindful and being educated and, and humbling yourself when you um, don't know um, and, and learning and finding out the correct and proper information and then sharing that with community members. One note on the felon thing, actually, Georgia's one of the more liberal is not the right word uh, as far as no um some states it's gone for life some states you have to go in front of a board that's essentially never going to even put your case so georgia's you know it's, it, i don't know we'll just leave it at that but um you two can go i had one more thing i was going oh yeah so as far as misinformation um so the board is the superintendent of elections. So we're the ones essentially signing our names, affirming that the the results are correct. I mean, I'm, I'm sure everyone in this room would not put their name on something unless they believe it to be correct. So, you know, I, I literally put my name on it and attest to it being correct, so. Do you have time for one more little thing? Sure. So with the open records request, they do ramp, Charlotte said two to four a month right now, <clears throat> but as we move into 2024, that will change rapidly. Um, it will begin to ramp up <clears throat> because one of the thing that couples open records requests and missing disinformation is groups <laughs> putting out um, survey, they look like survey forms online. And you fill it out, and the next thing you know, you've requested information from um, election offices all over the country, you know? <laughs> and it's actually uses it as a denial of service attack. It makes us so busy um, answering within three days, because we have to stay within the law, all of these open records requests that are basically just repeats, one after another, people not even knowing what they're asking for. Um, that we can't, it makes it very difficult to continue to do our own work, which is the purpose of those. So if you see those, please do not fill out those surveys unless you do really want the SOVC report from the, 20, uh, the 2019 election, you know, or, or something like that. Don't do it unless you really, really want this information. And if you do, then yes, please ask for it. Um, I want to create chaos in the office. Yeah, it's, so it's. We, so we make a mistake and then they come and take, like it's only calculated. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one more thing I wanted to add too is that um, I have heard of and, and witnessed situations mostly not in Athens but in more rural counties or um, heard horror stories of people trying to go vote um, and then being turned away from the poll uh, for reasons that could have been avoided or fixed um, but not sharing the information on how to fix it and so we could talk about that a little bit in terms of provisional ballots and things of that nature. I'm, I'm not well versed in it, so but I did want to bring that up because I've heard of that happening, and then that's why we do some of the voter election and protection education training that we do um, to inform people that, hey, when you get turned away at the polls, um, give us a call, let us know the situation, and if we can try to help you rectify it um, and figure out a way to let you cast your ballot um, that same day or the next day, um, then that's what, what we are here for, to try to help you do that. So if I can elaborate a little more on that, when a voter shows up at the polling location and their name is not found on the voter list, they have the option of voting a provisional ballot. But before they do that, our poll workers contacts our office first so that we can rectify the situation because it could be easily um, something that they're at the wrong polling location or that their name was misspelled or... Um, the date of birth was transposed for some reason that the voter registration wasn't found, that their name was taken off of the voter list and, re and captured by another county incorrectly, or their name was removed because for, somehow they're marked deceased. They really didn't pass away, but they had the same name as a voter who passed away. Um, and the wrong voter got removed. So there are errors sometimes that are t that, that are done, mistakes. And so that's an opportunity to correct that because a lot of the times when a voter goes to vote, 
that's the only time that they're going to have contact with our office is through that poll worker. So it's important that the poll worker calls our office so that we can, you know, we can reconcile with that voter and find out why their name is not on the voter list. But again, if nothing is able to be resolved at the time of that conversation, then the voter is allowed to vote a provisional ballot. One of the things that changed in the, in the 2022 election is if a voter goes to a polling location be, between the hours of 7 a.m. and 4.59 p.m., then they have to vote at their polling location. Can't go to the wrong polling location and say, well, I just want to vote a provisional ballot. You have to, you can only vote a provisional ballot in the wrong polling location after 5 p.m. Again, you have to be registered to vote. Okay, so that's that's a new new rule. And what that cut down on, there's some good, good and bad things about that. What that count, what it did improve on is if a voter goes to the wrong polling location before 5 p.m., they have to go to their correct polling location. One good thing about that is they're going to get the ballot that they're, they're assigned to. They're going, to. they're going to get the ballot that has the districts in it that they should vote in. So from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m., you can vote in the wrong precinct, but you may not get the ballot that has your districts on it. That particular precinct may not have that particular paper ballot with your districts on it. So you could be in Commission District 2, but that precinct only has Commission District 1 and 9 ballots. So then you're not allowed to vote on that. Okay, so that's that's talking about the out-of-precinct vo voter. But if a voter's name is not on the list for whatever reason, then once it's not reconciled with the poll manager and with our office, then the voter's voting a provisional ballot. We take 72 hours from that time to try to reconcile and determine if that person's ballot should count or not. And if it is determined that it is able to be counted, then we send a letter to the voter to say your ballot counted. And then in the future, this is where you should vote because technically you voted out of the wrong, at the wrong precinct. Or we were able to find your voter registration and was able to make the correction so that you would not have this issue the next election. But then there are some voters, unfortunately, that we that vote a provisional ballot and we're not able to determine if the ballot should count. And so that from following that, we do send a letter to the voter to say that your ballot was not counted, but here is a voter registration form, or we did receive your voter registration form from where you filled it out at the time of voting, and that your new polling location will be this particular location. So we try to reconcile all of those situations that if a voter that happens again, you know, it, it's they won't have a problem with voting. Well, I think we're about ready to wrap up for the evening, but I thought at first I would let um, maybe we just start uh, down with Broderick and come down the line and just any, you know, I, I always feel like, what do you want people to know about elections in Athens, right? Or what? What do you want people to tell their friends about tomorrow? And uh, and just uh, uh, or any last words you want to to utter? Whatever you want to talk about, I'm open. <laughs> um, yeah, Economic Justice Coalition. You know, again, 501c3, nonpartisan. Uh, we look for events and places to do voter registration. Um, we do intentionally reach out to areas where there are large populations and people of color who are usually not um, engaged sometimes in the process um, to try to get them engaged. Um, but again, we, we register whoever wants to get registered with us. Um, and so we also uh, try to work with people who are um, unhoused in certain situations, um, informing them that they can get an ID um, at the Board of Elections, a free voter ID. Um, so, um, and many of them run into so many other barriers, though, from having an address and to other, a myriad of other things, including, you know, just trying to find a good quality of life. And so, um, we, we do, though, like, try to reach out to all those special populations and inform them, engage them, let them know what's going on in the community, uh, provide opportunities for them to get engaged. Uh, we, we look for a partnership. Uh, we, we try to, we have a partnership with athens Clark County Library and other spaces here in Athens. Um, trying to work with ACC Transit. A lot of people go through our transit system at the Multimodal Center. And so I've been trying to reach out to them 
um, to get them to allow us to do voter registration there um, because I see so many people when I ride the bus sometimes uh, coming through the multimodal center. And then um, just want to encourage everybody to go out and, and vote. Um, there's some important elections are coming up. Um, can't tell people how to vote, but we do want people to exercise their right um, and encourage your, your friends to vote um, as well. I think I've said most of what I wanted to say. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, our, our board is a hardworking group of five very dedicated individuals who have five different opinions, and we find a way forward. We find a way to to make it better, to provide a better access to the ballot. Um, yeah, leave it at that. <laughs> So I just want to encourage everybody to always keep up with if you're registered to vote or not. Um, my my spiel to um, my family is if you didn't vote in the last election, you need to verify if you're registered to vote because things happen. Um, there are errors that, that, that could hinder you from voting. And the day of the election is not the day to check. The last day to register to vote is not the day to check. The, the day that you go and vote is not the day to check. You should be checking your registration prior to the last day to register to vote to make sure your name is on the voter list. And then I encourage everybody to get involved. And you can get involved by first voting and then, two, becoming a poll worker. And if you ever consider running for office, you know, that's something that you should, should do. And you could contact our office for any of those opportunities. I also encourage you to... Um, See if you could be on a list of poll watchers so um, that you would have the opportunity to come in and observe the voting process because nobody can just come in and observe, right? You're either going to be voting or you're going to be a poll watcher or, or you're a poll worker. And uh, poll watchers are um, selected or appointed by uh, candidates or by political parties. So if you want to get involved, those are ways to get involved. And of course, our office is always available. You can contact us. If you ever need us to come and um, speak to you, your Sunday school class, your um, if you want to host something at your house or whatever, we're available. We'll be glad to come over and um, give you a little bit of what we do because we, we love what we do. It's our life and we love it. I don't think Charlotte left me anything to say. <laughs> <laughs> I was ticking off in my head. <laughs> she was like, all right. Um, do you have the early voting dates? It starts on this early voting for the, well, this is next year. Yeah, the last day to register to vote is October 10th for the November 7th election. Um, early voting starts on October 16th uh, through 11-3. And what's the next one? Oh, last day to request an absentee ballot is the 27th of um, October. So, I mean, I could say a little bit about our office. Um, I don't know if you realize how small our office is and how few people make this happen for you on a regular basis in athens Clark County. We have five full-time employees. That's correct, right? Yeah, and one of those is an administrative assistant. Um, and Charlotte is one of them. And then we have three elections assistants who do various portions, uh, are responsible for various portions of the job, an absentee ballot clerk, and then a, an election assistant who runs the office and the registration portion, and then me. And then the rest of our employees are part-time employees. Um, and they, you know, they're dedicated people, but it's a part-time job, so they come and go, you know, um, every couple of years. And we miss them when they leave. <laughs> but we're a very close family, and we, we work very hard for you guys. Well, thank you all. Oh, yeah, sorry. Brian. And um, <laughs> try to come to a Board of Elections meeting every once in a while. <laughs> uh, I, I've been to the, the last few, and um, they're not very well attended. Um, they're not very lively either. <laughs> they can uh, be. They can they be can at be. times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's an opportunity to give input and public comment. Uh, we always encourage over at EJC people to go uh, get involved in local politics and to voice their opinions, concerns, ask questions, raise questions, give suggestions. And so, yeah, please come out. And thank you for hosting us, Cena. Well, thank you for.
for everybody for coming and talking to us. Really.